of the Torah. Baruch ata Yehovah Eloheinu melech haralem asher keshanu b'mitzvata betzivinu lo asak b'interei Torah. Please, Yehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name and the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Are we ready? We who live in the shelter of Elyon, who spend our in whom we trust, he will rescue us from the trap of the hunter, from the plague of calamities. He will cover us with his pinions, and under his wings we will find refuge. His truth is a shield and protection. We will not fear the terrors of night or the arrow that flies by day or the plague that roams in the dark or the scourge that wreaks havoc at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near us. Only keep your op eyes open and we will see how the wicked are punished. For we have made Adonai the Most High, who is our refuge, our dwelling place. No disaster will happen to us. No calamity will come near our tent. For he will order his angels to care for us and guard us wherever we go. And they will carry us in their hands so that we won't trip on a stone. We will tread down lions and snakes, young lions and serpents. We will trample underfoot. And because he loves me, I will rescue him. And because he knows my name, I will protect him. He will call on me and I will answer him. And I will be with him when he is in trouble. I will extricate him and bring him honor. I will satisfy him with long life and show him my <coughs> salvation. Amen. You can be seated after a shout. Hallelujah. Just to let you know, Sister Bertha is doing well. She's in sheltering arms. And we have information if you want to send her some stuff or her phone number if you want to call her. Michael is back home, so we are glad about that. Amen. And we're just continuing thanking the Lord for all those that need a healing that will be healed and those who need deliverance shall be delivered. Well, we're in the book of Job, as you well know. We're in it now for 19 weeks. We have arrived to Job chapter 19. <clears throat> we know that Bildad had spoken to Job and Job was wet ready just to give his uh, mind to share some things that he wanted to share with Bildad. We know that <clears throat> what Job has gone through, he went through something that was very quick to go through. He lost some homes. He lost some servants. He lost some, uh, uh, some uh, animals. He lost his 10 children. Uh, his wife came, and she spoke, and she didn't stay very long because when she spoke, he had a rebuttal, which made her just depart. And then we know that these three guys, three friends, showed up so that they could wrap their arms around him and love him, but they didn't do that. They came just to bring <clears throat> condemnation and theology to him and try to get him to repent, even though we know, because we read chapter 1, that he had not sinned, and this is not because of sin. This is not because um, of anything else that he has done other than this is a cause and God is revealing some things within himself, and God is revealing uh, himself to, to Job. <clears throat> He's now experiencing boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. We already went through that. You know it's gross. It's horrible. He's lost weight. He's been crying. He is sunken. Um, <clears throat> maggots and flies and whatever else is upon him. And so um, we find that he is just dealing with a lot of things. So now we arrive, this is a second cycle, and as this second cycle <clears throat> is uh, really coming to an end because we have one more uh, friend and then Job's rebuttal. Job, like I said last week, believes that his vindicator and his redeemer will ultimately arise on his behalf. And we made <clears throat> the connection that that would be, of course, understanding for us because we have accepted Yeshua as our Savior, and we know who our Redeemer is and who our Vindicator is, who our Intercessor is, that would be Yeshua. But in those days, of course, they're looking to see who's he talking about, and of course, <clears throat> there's a lot of speculation when it comes to, um, you know, interpretations, but we pretty well know that he is running away from God to run to God, and we all know what that means, because sometimes we run away, but yet we run to him. We're upset. You know, and I, I relate that to a, a, a mother and father as a child who's gotten disciplined. When you get disciplined, you run away. But at the same time, after you run away, you run back. 
<clears throat> because what do you need from your mother and father after you've been yelled at, screamed at, and beaten? You need some love, right? <laughs> you need some love. And, <clears throat> and so we, we know that's how that is. We, we run away, but yet we run too. So when we look at Job 19, let's look at it. We'll, we'll read uh, verses 1 through 6, and then we'll tear, tear them apart a little bit. It says, Then Job answered, How long will you go on making me angry, crushing me with words? Again, he's talking now to Bildad. You've insulted me ten times already. <clears throat> Aren't you ashamed to treat me so badly? Even if it's true that I made a mistake, my error stays with me. You may take a superior attitude toward me and cite my disgrace as proof against me, but know that it's God who has put me in the wrong and closed his net around me. If we look at verses 1 through 3, <clears throat> Job's, Job is asking his friends, really, how long will you torment me and crush me with words? Now, remember, some of their words were okay because <clears throat> their words were theologically sound, but not theologically <clears throat> um, applicable to his situation. And that's what we have to understand sometimes. You know, and I, I gave you the example of the woman caught in adultery. <clears throat> yes, she, by the law, theologically, <clears throat> with orthodox standards, Yeshua could have stepped back and let her be stoned. Correct? But Yeshua sees something more than what we see. Remember, man looks on the outward, God looks on the inward. And so he saw a disciple in her. He saw a follower in her. He saw someone <clears throat> that maybe was caught up in what she was caught up in because of situations and circumstances that none of these men would understand. So God used the law to bring her out. Because the only way the stoning could happen is if there were two or three witnesses, and very quickly he got rid of the two or three witnesses. So he wasn't <clears throat> winking at her um, fornication. What he was doing was using the law to bring her forgiveness instead of using the law to destroy her. And so when we look at what Job is asking, he's saying, how long will you torment me and crush me with these words? <clears throat> and he says, you've done this ten times. Now, again, ten times, when we see ten times, then we need to look through the Bible where else it says ten times, right, to see if we can have a connection. And so when we look at that, that identical phrase translated these ten times occurs in Hebrews chapter 14, verse 22, that says, None of the people who saw my glory and the signs I did in Egypt and in the desert yet tested me these ten times and did not listen <coughs> to my voice. So in Numbers 14, 22, when Jehovah tells Moses that the Israelites have put him to test these 10 times in the wilderness, we find that Job is, again, in relationship with that because these friends have tempted him 10 times. <clears throat> God is saying Israel has tempted him 10 times. And what Job is saying is you as friends are tempting me. You have tested my patience. Again, I think about sometimes when we said, oh, Lord, give me the patience of Job. How many's ever said that? How many's ever prayed that? Wow, you should have waited till you had this Bible study. <clears throat> because when you say, Lord, give me the patience of Job, then the patience of Job must come through the situations of Job. This is what I've told uh, Africa a lot of times. You want the blessing of America, then you're going to have the curse of America. You want the blessing of whatever's going on then you, or the anointing, then you have to have everything that goes along with it. And so what we find here <clears throat> is that when you say, God, let me have patience, give me the patience of Job. Well, Job had patience for two chapters, sporadically every once in a while throughout all the other chapters. But we see more impatience than we see patience. We see more stubbornness than we see submission. But either way, they're mixed in there, and at the end, it all comes back out, right? <clears throat> it all comes out in the wash, like we say. So while they shame him with these accusations, they are not in the least bit ashamed to attack or wrong him. <clears throat> Sometimes when we believe that we are right, then we are not ashamed nor upset that we have wronged someone or saying the wrong things because we really think that we are right. 
Correct? So let's look at verses 4 through 6. Even if it's true <clears throat> that I made a mistake, even if it's true, what he's saying is, I didn't do it, but even if it was true, my heir stays with me. <clears throat> what does it have to do with you? Right? Really, why are you sitting here? If, if the reason why you came was to come for me, that would be great. If you're coming to talk about my heir, it's mine. Leave me alone. Right? <clears throat> you may take a superior attitude toward me and cite my disgrace as proof against me, but know that it's God who has put me in the wrong and closed his net around me. So here's Job who states that if, if he's really erred, if he's really done something wrong, then it is because he's done it all by himself. And so there, who has made then these friends his judge and jury? It's his life. And he alone bears the consequences of his actions, <clears throat> which is true. Every one of us make decisions. We all go down paths. And when the consequences come, then they are our consequences of our actions. Now, other people might have to deal with some things that you have done, <clears throat> but the bulk of those consequences are on you. So if they wanted to lord it over him, and that word lord literally means to magnify themselves over him, which a lot of times when we find someone who's in the wrong and we are not in the wrong at that moment, we really like to run in there <clears throat> because it makes us feel superior. Correct? And what did Paul say? If it wasn't for the grace of God, right, where would he go? <clears throat> He'd go the same way. So there was something that they needed to know. So when you look at verse 6, it says, but know that it's God who has put me in the wrong and closed his net around me. And he wanted them to know that. If you're going to judge someone, if you're going to be the judge and the jury, if you're going to try to figure out who's in the wrong, God or me, I want you to know something. And remember, God's not afraid of his wild speech, just like he's not afraid of yours. God's not afraid of his dumb speech, just like he's not afraid of yours. How many ever said something to God, acted a certain way, and then realized, wow, I just that, did that to God? <clears throat> and aren't you glad you're still living? You didn't ex explode in a puff of uh, dust and dirt, right? You're still living and walking. <clears throat> so God's a big God. He, again, thank God he knows your heart because sometimes your mouth speaks. And even though it says out of your mouth, <clears throat> you know, your heart speaks or what's in your heart, your, your mouth speaks about it. We also know that there's some things that just out of emotions and feelings we say, right? That's another thing. When you take that verse and say out of your <clears throat> heart, the mouth speaks, then we'll wrap that around anyone. And we all know that sometimes it's, though that's true. Sometimes it's just because of something else. So we have this direct accusation against Jehovah that was denied by Bildad, and he wants them to get it. Bildad, understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> I'm not the problem. God is. And you all keep ignoring the problem <clears throat> because you keep bringing this theology to me and, and saying about the wicked, and I'm not wicked, and I <clears throat> can testify that God himself said I'm blameless and righteous. So you need to kind of look at this thing a little bit different, Bildad and Sofar and, <clears throat> and Eliphaz, and, <clears throat> and realize that if anyone has done something wrong, it would be God. Well, it, this direct accusation against Jehovah that was denied by Bildad and will be denied by the fourth friend, who is a symbolism of Elijah, <clears throat> basically we know that Shaddai does not pervert justice, correct? So how does verse 6 then relate to verse 4 and 5, where he reproaches his friends? Well, it was not I who abused Jehovah, is what Job is saying, but Jehovah who acted unjustly toward me. <clears throat> now, we gasp at that, but I guarantee you that we have been through some things that all of us have, whether we voice it or not, said, God, you're against me. I didn't do anything. I don't deserve this. <clears throat> yeah, you might not have it written in a book. Again, hallelujah. Hallelujah right? I don't want this notoriety. I don't want the book of Jeff because I would ban you all from reading it. 
if Job had sinned inadvertently, <clears throat> then the friends would have grounds to reproach him, which is why he said, even if I did err. But the true state of affairs is that the wrongdoing is not Job's. It's God's. Again, thank God I'm not Job. Let's look at verses 7 through 12. <clears throat> if I cry violence, no one hears me. I cry aloud, but there's no justice. He has fenced me off my way so that I can't pass. He has covered my past with darkness. He has stripped me of my glory, removed the crown from my head. He tears every part of me down. I'm gone. He uproots my hope like a tree, inflamed with anger against me. He counts me as one of his foes. His troops advance together. They make their way against me and encamp around my tent. He's in a bad way. In verse 7, he says, if I cry violence, no one hears me. Well, again, when Job is speaking, sometimes what he does is says something that is contrary or in contrast to what the word actually says. Because, again, he's trying to figure it out, isn't he? So he'll say something that is contrary to the word of God. And the reason why he says that is because he should be on the contrast, not the side he's in. And maybe sometimes, you know, when you're going through something, say you're going through a sickness, you might say, by his stripes I am healed. But you're still going through <clears throat> sickness. So you are in contrast to what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that you should walk in wholeness, and you are sick. So sometimes to combat what we are going through, to kind of figure out what is going on theology-wise in our brains, we have to speak the Word even though in us it's contrary to what's going on. You have no money, you have no food, you have nothing, and so what do you, what do you say? My God shall supply all my needs. And what you're saying is, God, you need to supply my needs. And so that's what Job is saying. God, in Psalms 18, uh, verse 7 says, In my distress I called to Adonai, I cried out to my God, and what happens? Out of his temple he heard my voice, my cry reached his ears. What, he say, what is he saying to God? Through Bildad. I've been crying for a very long time and God has not done a thing. Verse 8 and 10. He has fenced off my way so that I can't pass. He has covered my past with darkness. He has stripped me of my glory and removed the crown from my head. He tears every part of me down. I am gone. He uproots my hope like a tree. <clears throat> this is what Yehovah has done to Job. Now, when I say that, I need you to understand, this is what Job believes Yehovah has done to him. And a lot of times... <clears throat> We voice it, and we look at Job, and we can see where Job is coming from because, <clears throat> again, he's lost his ten children. He's lost a lot of stuff. His wife came and said, just curse God. So he said, get away from me, you low-class lady. And she left. Three guys come in. He's filled with boils. <clears throat> Everything is coming against him. He doesn't know what to do. And so he feels like there is no hope, right? Right? And he feels like this is what God has done because God could rescue him. If the doctor said you were <clears throat> deathly ill, could not God have stopped you from being deathly ill? Could not have God stopped some of this, the, the bleeding of your life? Could he have not warned you of a snare? <clears throat> Put up a roadblock? Brought a donkey to say, I'm not going the way you want to go, right? And maybe he has brought a lot of donkeys in your life. You just don't listen to him. <clears throat> That's neither here nor there. Job is utterly constrained. He's trapped in a spiritual and physical nightmare. <clears throat> no way out. But yet, we know what the Scripture says. God doesn't tempt us in any way. Does it bring us anything that there's not a what? A way of escape? Well, how is Job going to escape this thing? So he's trapped in this kind of spiritual <clears throat> and physical nightmare. Has anyone ever been in a spiritual and physical nightmare? 
Sometimes we're in a physical nightmare, and thank God we have the spiritual sight and encouragement. And sometimes we're physically okay, and we're dealing with things spiritually. But he's dealing with things physically and spiritually. There's no way out for him, no one to appeal to God for him, right? Now, we have glimpses when he says, my redeemer and my vindicator is coming. <clears throat> but before that, he would just like for it to be now. Jehovah has completely debased him. The one who exalted him has humiliated him before the world, tearing him down on every side so that Job can only say in verse 10, he tears me every part of me down. I am gone. <clears throat> he uproots my hope like a tree. Basically, and I perish. My hope uprooted like a tree, which means I had hope. And remember, what we said was, it's not how you begin. It's not how you end. <clears throat> it's the journey in between that everyone focuses on. Right? Everyone looks at how you're running, what you're doing, how you're responding, how you're going through it, <clears throat> what you're saying, what you're not saying, how you're acting. <clears throat> and lo they're looking at Job, and they're kind of scratching their head because they've expected more. But yet, they have never gone through what Job has gone through. Sometimes our expectations of people don't match our expectations of us. We expect more from other people than we expect from our own selves. So verse 11 and 12 says, Inflamed with anger against me, he counts me as one of his foes. His troops advance together. They make their way against me and encamp around my tent. <clears throat> this vividly describes Job's current state of mind and the degree of emotional distress that he is experiencing. And again, I cannot fathom what he's going through, how to handle it, how to deal with it, how to compartmentalize it, how to really <clears throat> bring it into a place where you can understand what is going on, how to rectify it between you and God and then deal with these friends. There's a lot of things that are going on that as we read his uh, <clears throat> speech, especially in verse uh, chapter 19, there's more going on than, than meets the eye. And he says things in passing that has great repercussions in his life, and it would have the same in ours. He has nowhere to go. He's completely surrounded, massively outnumbered. And the only one who can help is the one orchestrating the attack. Because where does our help come from? <clears throat> from God. And who is doing this? In Job's mind. God. So I can't even go to the one who can help me because he is the one who's orchestrating this attack. He does have some times of uh, pity parties, don't we all? Woe is me. I don't deserve this. Uh, God should be more loving to me. I was a great pick. <laughs> don't know why I have to go through this. <clears throat> you couldn't get anyone better than me. We might not have voiced it that way, but we think it, right? Because then we start looking at other people's lives and we think, well, they're not going through anything. And I serve God and they don't serve God. And my life's a wreck and their life's okay. Now, again, you don't look up when you say it, but you're, you're, you say it out loud so God gets it. Has anyone ever said something in the, in the line of hearing for someone? I, I wasn't talking to you. Yes, you were. I just want you to know, yes, you were. <clears throat> you were saying it in a way that I can't pinpoint for sure that you were saying it to me. And I can't grab a hold of you and say, why did you say that? You said it in a way that you can escape the consequences of it. I feel you all feeling me. <clears throat> Verses 13 through 17 says, He has made my brothers keep their distance. Those who know me are holy and strang from me. My kinfolk have failed me. My close friends have forgotten me. Those living in my house consider me a stranger. My slave girls, too, in their view. I'm a foreigner. I call my servant. He doesn't answer. Even if I beg him for a favor, my wife can't stand my breath. 
I just find that to be interesting. Out of all the things, she can't stand my breath. I am loathsome to my own family. <clears throat> so when we look at 18 and 19, so what we find is adding insult to injury, <clears throat> lost 10 children. He lost his sheep, his herds, and his uh, prosperity. He lost some servants. He lost his now dignity, his uh, crown, his glory. <clears throat> He's, uh, his looks are gone because just pus and ooze and, and not eating and, and all that. Everything is gone. He has three great friends that have come to just to antagonize him, to encourage him, to tell God what the sin is. What they were trying to say is, what did you do? I want to know what it was. Adding this insult to injury, even the youngsters now disgrace Job, if you look at this in 18 and 19. <clears throat> and when he stands up, rather than revering him, they don't do a thing. You have to understand that because in Leviticus 19.32, <clears throat> according to the law, you stand up in the presence of a person with gray hair. And that means that young person stands when they enter the room, somewhat like what we do in Africa. If, if the <clears throat> men enter the room, uh, we're supposed to stand up and greet them right away. You don't sit down. That's disrespectful to those who are coming in. <clears throat> so stand up in the presence of a person with gray hair. Show respect for the old you are to fear God. I am Adonai. So they walk into the room and you happen to be gray haired and children are standing around or <clears throat> sitting around. When they see you, they should, out of respect, stand. You say, that's really ridiculous. Ridic ridiculous for us today because we haven't taught it. Not so ridiculous for times going past. Right. <clears throat> there used to be a whole lot more respect for elderly, <clears throat> for older, for more mature people. Today, it's not so we wouldn't say some things that we would. I would never speak <clears throat> to my grandparents like some people speak to their grandparents today. Just wasn't heard of. You just didn't do it. <clears throat> because there was a level of respect. You didn't have to know them. They didn't have to earn your respect. You know, today we're like, if I, you want respect, you need to earn respect. Uh, whoever, uh, where is that? That means you would have, you'd have to respect anyone because you don't earn a lot of respect. There is a station in life. There's places in life, but you just respect <clears throat> because of the level of time, of, of how long they lived position wise there is just a level of respect and we certainly can see in today's world that is out the window out the window totally <clears throat> so job now moves from this vivid metaphor into this kind of concrete reality okay <clears throat> he he is watching and seeing and understanding <clears throat> that now to add this insult, all that he's going through, now he's losing some of those other places, family, kindred, respect. <clears throat> and this is polar opposite of what Job deserves at this point in his life. It's, it's kind of like, you know, <clears throat> if you've ever been disrespected and you're an older person, you say, listen, I didn't live my life this long to be disrespected. I didn't give, you know, if your children disrespect you, <clears throat> there's a way that you say, I, I gave birth to you, I fed you, I, did, I, I don't deserve, right, this disrespect just by mere living and not killing you, which I had many opportunity to do so. <clears throat> there should be an act of respect. So here we find that his most intimate friends now detest him. And those whom he loved, the people closest to him and most important to him, have turned against him. <clears throat> what he's saying is, 
I could call my servant. They were coming to, to serve me. And he's not saying because I, I am a master of their servant, because they loved him and respected him, and they would come. And now he's a puddle of ooze, and he calls for his servants, and no one's coming. Why? Because every single one of them think the same thing the three friends say. What did you do to deserve this? And what you ever did to make God mad, then alleviates my respect for you. Everything has turned upside down in the most painful way, personal way. You can deal with loss as long as someone's around and loves you and cares about you. You can deal <clears throat> with sickness as long as someone's there to encourage you. But when everyone has left you, he's struggling. Verse 20 says, my bones stick to my skin escape by the skin of my teeth. So not only outside things have turned against him, but his own body. <clears throat> now, you all know a lot of times that's true for us. You can go through a lot of things emotionally. A lot of things can happen at work or not happen at work or this and that. But if all those things happen and then your body betrays you, when you used to be able to get up and now you can't, Right? <clears throat> you said, well, I don't need anybody. I can do it all on my own. And you wake up the next morning, you realize you can't do nothing because you can't even get out of bed. The one thing that you could count on was your body. And now that's kaput. He's almost dead, but not quite. How many of you ever felt I'm almost dead, but not quite? <laughs> I'm hanging in there. And as you get older, it's, that means certain days. You know, certain days you're really good. Then certain days you're like, I don't even know why I'm getting up. Because, frankly, it's taking me a little bit too long to get up. I don't know if I can, frankly, get up. Who in the world would expect that in just a few verses <clears throat> when we look at this? 1 through 20. Who would expect that, again, remember, we know that Job goes in. And out. He's patient. He's impatient. He's submissive. He is <clears throat> defiant. He is hopeless, and then he's hopeful. But who would expect that in just a few verses, Job would be making one of his or anybody's greatest statements of faith? In the midst of Job's crazy, testing, trial, horrific moment, there is a light of faith that bursts through. And the commentaries and the interpreters <clears throat> say, out of all the verses in the Bible, this one is a statement of greatest faith. Let me ask you this. Can you, would you make a statement, your greatest statement of faith, in the midst of everything that you've gone through of the horrificness of this testing or trial? Because sometimes we go through something very small and we can't find our faith at all. Let's look at 21 and 22 as we come to it. Pity me, friends of mine, pity me. <laughs> For the hand of God has struck me. Must you pursue me as God does, never satisfied with my flesh? Because what does he want? He just wants someone to hold his hand. <clears throat> maybe sup up some of the ooze. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe get a fly away from him. He's not interested in speech at this moment. He just needs help. Well, he has a wife. Yes, his wife came in and said, just curse God, die. Can't you just do something? Can, can you not just bring me a glass of water? Can you, can you not just shut up long enough to go to the running brook and bring me some fresh water? You know I'm thirsty. Can you not just go down the street to KFC and get me some chicken? He feels... Betrayed, he feels attacked, he feels rebuked, and in his weakness and pain, he appeals to them, begging them, just stand with me. That's all I need. Just stand with me. You know, a lot of times we think we need to fix things for people, and sometimes they just need us to stand. That's it. You can't fix it sometimes. 
There's no words that will ever change anything. All you can do is say, I'm here for you. When you want to talk, I'll talk. If not, I'll stand. Now, don't stand there and stare at him. But in his weakness and pain, he appeals to them, begging them, please just stand with me. He's pleading with them to have a heart. Because so far in the first cycle and now uh, three-fourths way in, in the second cycle, they have no heart. And what's happening is the first cycle they had a little bit. In the second cycle, they're, they're now not having anything. Can you imagine what's going to happen in the third cycle? Because it only gets worse. Let's look at verses 23 <clears throat> through um, 27. I wish my words were written down that they were inscribed in a scroll, that engraved with iron and filled with lead, they were cut into rock forever. Here it comes, verse 25. The greatest statement of faith known throughout all the Bible. But I know that my Redeemer lives. But I know that my Redeemer lives. That in the end, he will rise on the dust so that after my skin has been thus destroyed, that even without my flesh, I will see God. I will see him for myself. My eyes, not someone else's, will behold him. My heart grows weak inside of me. 23 and 24. As much as Job pleads with his friends to pity him, he puts no confidence in them. What do we say all the time? Trust God. Love people. If you trust people, and again, that's not that you have to be like. <clears throat> but if all your trust is in people, people will fail you. I've got news for you. I will fail you. What? Yes, because you will expect something that I don't know you expect, right? Have you ever had a fight with maybe your husband and wife, and they say, what's wrong? And they, and they say to you, you know. No, I really don't. You know. Just think about it long enough because you know. I've been thinking a long time, and I still don't know. Well, then if you don't know, I'm not telling you. Okay, then. Because I don't know what else to do. <clears throat> so as much as Job pleads with his friends to pity him, he has no confidence in him. But instead, he looks forward to his ultimate vindication and redemption. No matter what this world does to us, no matter what we go through, no matter how many people leave you and betray you and, and what comes against you, if your body fails you, know this. Know that your Redeemer lives. <clears throat> and that even if in dust and skin, he comes and stands. You will see him face to face. If your body is gone, you will see him face to face because what this world can do to you doesn't matter. He was wishing his words could be preserved as a lasting witness. Wish it would be engraved somewhere. and He didn't know it was for generation after generation after generation to know it. <clears throat> because what he was saying is, I wish it was written down because surely I will be proven right in the end. When human civilization has failed, his words will remain bold, confident, defiant, and enduring. I didn't do nothing wrong to deserve this. On your deathbed, I'm dying, but I didn't do anything to... So verse 25, verse 25 in the complete Jewish Bible says, but I know. But in really the, the, the more accurate translation is, for I know. For I know that my Redeemer lives, that in the end he will rise on the dust. Because that word for means I am absolutely certain. I am totally confident. I know that I know that I <clears throat> no. Hold on, Job. Uh, we just had some conversations. I wish I was never born. 
I wish that if I, though I was born, I was still born. I wish you wouldn't even thought about me. Uh, I wish I was dead. Don't know why I'm here. God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you attacking me? Really? <clears throat> we get to verse 25, and all of a sudden something rises up inside of him. For I know, I am certain, I am totally confident. Gives you a glimpse because he's totally confident in him. Right? Not them. Not his wife, not his friends, not his relatives that have left him, not anyone else that was there and now is no longer there, not his servants. All of them don't see the bigger picture, but there's one standing, waiting to vindicate you, one who is waiting to redeem you. And certainly when we stand there and he redeems us, he's not going to say, oh, they were perfect in all their ways. His redemption and his vindication is that he has died for us and bought us. This verse, verse 25, marks one of the high points of the book, in fact, of the entire Bible in terms of professions of faith. <clears throat> yeah, we did that one. It was a while back. There's so many just small little moments, and the rest of them are just, Kill me, kill you, get away from me, I hate your face. <clears throat> but every once in a while, there's a moment, right? And so for this future vindication, for rather than but, I'm absolutely certain, I am totally confident, I know that my Redeemer lives. Don't you love that song when people sing that? <clears throat> well, let's look really quick at what Redeemer means, a goel, Redeemer in Hebrew. <clears throat> it means someone tied to you by covenant, usually a relative whose calling was to stand for you when you were wronged. I gave you some, <clears throat> some verses to look up. I don't have time to pull all those out, but that's what a redeemer is. So we know that a redeemer is physically and also a redeemer is spiritually. So you could be a redeemer. We know that Boaz was a kinsman redeemer, which means he was a relative, some removed, and that means he then had a covenant with her, right? <clears throat> so it's usually a relative whose calling was to stand for you when you were wronged, which means if you were murdered, then he saw to it that the murderer was punished, he didn't say, oh, man, I'm so sad. He made sure that that was taken care of. If, if you um, share in the land was under threat, he safeguarded it. Today we just say things like, it's your land, you got to do what you got to do. No, if you are a redeemer, <clears throat> then you fight for them when they can't fight. If you're a widow and you were childless, he gave her a child. If you were enslaved, he brought you out. As God brings out Israel out of Egypt. Look at um, Psalms 19, 14, and Psalm 77, 15. <clears throat> so in every way, he stood for you when you could not stand for yourself. He was your champion. He's your vindicator. How many are thankful that God stands with you when no one else stands with you? If he is for you, who can be against you? And yes, it is great and would be wonderful, and that's what really <clears throat> a community is all about, that when we may come with one another, that we should be each other's redeemer. That if someone attacks you, then we come and stand with you. If you're about ready to lose something, we come and stand with you. Right? And we've had to do that on occasion because that's who we are. That's what we're called to do. And our example is Yeshua, who doesn't leave us or forsake us. Correct? <clears throat> and Psalms 19, 14 says, May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be acceptable in your presence, Adonai, my rock and redeemer. 
So a redeemer to us sometimes in our thinking processes is that he just came to save us from our sin, done. No. If you're enslaved, he come to bring you out. If you're, if you're being threatened, he's come to protect you. <clears throat> if you're childless, he'll give you a child. If something has happened to you, he'll come and vindicate. That's his job. In Psalms 77, 15, with your arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Yaakov and Yosef, Selah. With your arm, you redeemed your people. <clears throat> you found them. Where did he find them? In Egypt. And what did he do with them? He brought them out. There was some discipline going on when he brought them out. Came out with some plagues, some that they didn't have to endure, some they had to endure. Right? <clears throat> They were being taught. They were being disciplined. They were being uh, brought to a place of understanding that he was the father and they were the children. Correct? So it wasn't just all high fives, now go do what you want, now run, do what you want. No. A covenant, right? So Yehovah is our Redeemer. <clears throat> but Job doesn't simply say, I know the Redeemer lives. His faith is personal. And he says what? <clears throat> it's very tenacious. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives. These six words need to be engraved in your brain. That no matter what you're going through, you say to yourself, I know my Redeemer lives. We want Instant vindication. We want instant change. We want instant healing. We want instant deliverance. We want all those things instantly <clears throat> because we've not been taught that sometimes you have to endure and go through. Right? That it rains on the just and the unjust. We have lived now in a church society that says you're blessed, 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 and if you're not blessed, you're doing something wrong. You exhibit faith not in your blessing you exhibit what kind of faith you have when you're not going through a mountain or a blessing anyone can have faith when everything's going well right why are you so happy pastor jeff well i got all the money i need i live in the house that i want to live in got every car that i can want me and my wife are getting along children are doing well Dog hadn't killed anyone lately, maimed an animal or anything like that. Church is going great, in God good. Amen. But what about if not everything's going well? Can you still say, I know my Redeemer lives? This is why Yehovah spoke so highly of Job in the beginning. And we'll again speak about him at the end of the book because he saw within him that no matter what he's going to go through, he knows his Redeemer lives. Because <clears throat> even though he's been challenged by this relationship, even though he has been confused by what's going on, he still knows within him there is this relationship that he has formed with God. And that bond has not been broken. Even though he doesn't get why he's not rushing in, even though he doesn't get why this is happening to him, there's still a relationship there. And he knows he lives. And somewhere at the end, even though he had appreciated he didn't go through any of it. This is part of Job's integrity. This is why God looks at him and says he's blameless and righteous. Because in the midst of life defined by persecution, Job dares to assert that there is something more to believe in than in justice. And that something is expressed in terms of Goel or Redeemer. We always want justice. We don't deserve it. God, come and do it. Fix this. Fix this. Fix this. Even though we messed it up. Right? As a child, you break a toy you just got. You cry. You want your dad or mama to fix it. But you broke it. Then if it can't be fixed, then we blame mom and dad for not fixing it. Right? Sometimes the broken toy just has to be left broken. 
until you can find someone to fix it or buy another one. But I'm thankful that when it comes to us, God is patient. Are we just as patient with God? So who is Job's redeemer? In context, we know that Yehovah would be his redeemer and that Job is reaffirming his faith at this moment. As short as it is, he's still reaffirming. <clears throat> I, I think if you look back at your life, there are, even in the midst of a great turmoil, uh, when you're confused, there'll be moments of insight, moments of grabbing hold of God, and then you pull back a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but there's still moments because you have a relationship with God, and that's something you will not let go. Now, from our viewpoint, our Redeemer is Yeshua, right? So when all that is left in dust, the Redeemer will arise on his behalf, delivering him from a false accusation and a tainted legacy, proving his innocence beyond question or doubt, and when does he believe that even if it doesn't happen now, God will do it when he's gone? That is somewhat unacceptable to us. Because when God says he'll vindicate us, we want to see it. Right? We want to see it now. When he says the enemy is underneath your feet, we want to see them underneath our foot. We want the pleasure of that. <clears throat> There's something wrong with understanding that that way. Because the pleasure is just to serve him. Even if through testings and trials and persecutions or even death. You've seen a lot of people come to know Yeshua. A lot of, if you go back and read the Fox's uh, Book of Martyrs, <clears throat> you know, um, a lot of people who've gone in first to maybe some places that never knew the gospel and they end up being killed, that that really opens the gospel up in that area. There had to be a sacrifice. I don't get it. Don't understand it. Don't know why it has to happen. But I'm not God, am I? And you're not God. So let's look at verse 26. So that after my skin has been thus destroyed, that even without my flesh I see God, I will see him for myself, my eyes not someone else's, and will behold him. My heart grows weak inside of me. He expects a future face-to-face -face encounter with Jehovah, his Redeemer. Therefore, th through resurrection, he will see Jehovah. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, the end is not the end because if you die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You win. You win. Might not look like it to the world. You win. You might say, that's sad, that's horrible, that's true. You win. No matter how it goes, you win. We win. Job will see Jehovah, his defender, with his very own eyes. His Jehovah will not disown him. Someone needs to be excited about that because the way Job is speaking, if we were to have a counseling time with Job, we would say, Job, I think you have lost your salvation. I don't think you're going to make it at this moment. But God sees inside, inside out, right? His Jehovah will not disown him as a stranger, but rather he will vindicate him as a kinsman redeemer. He says, my heart grows weak inside me. <clears throat> well, the very thought of this causes Job's innermost being. And we know that, you know, we translate that word heart, but literally in Hebrew it would say kidneys. And we're thinking kidneys. But kidneys are actually considered the seat of emotion and affection. In Proverbs 23, 16, Psalm 16, 7, Psalm 73, 21, you are very mature disciples. You can read them later. But well, the seat of emotion, those affections, are related to the kidney. And so what he's saying is, is that the very thought of this causes Job's innermost part being to pine away with him. 28 and 29, as we come to the end. If you say, how will we persecute him? The root of the matter is found in me. You had best fear the sword, for 
for anger brings the punishment of the sword, so that you will know there is judgment. Perhaps from this vantage point of great confidence, Job now rebukes his friends in the sternest of terms, putting words on their lips in apparent response to that verse 22, where he accuses them of persecuting him. So what Job is actually stating is, how in the world are we persecuting him since he's the one entirely at fault, the cause of all these problems? Literally, the root of the matter is found in him. So you had better be afraid of the sword, divine judgment. Because what he's saying to them is this. <clears throat> I know that I haven't done anything. God has called me blameless and righteous. So therefore, this is nothing from me but from him. So friends, be careful. Be careful. For anger brings the judgment of the sword so that you will know the certainty of coming judgment. Because what you're saying is not true. You're, you're putting a definition on God that's not him. You're saying things for him that he has not told you to say. So be careful. The Bible tells us to judge our own selves lest we be judged. So then when you see how Jehovah deals in this world with human anger, which obviously inflamed your ugly words against me, is what he's saying. That should make you reflect on the final judgment that he will bring against this human wickedness. And Job finishes. And so while Job will be vindicated on that future day, his friends, because of their angry, ugly words, will be cut down presumably in this world. Now, he doesn't have the privilege of seeing the end of the book. We have the privilege of reading the end of the book. And we know that God is not pleased with those three Hebrew boys and puts them in a fiery furnace of words, him being the fourth man spewing it, right? <clears throat> so Job is satisfied at this moment, but guess what? There's one more friend taking their turns. So the friend so far has to come, and he has to now share his wisdom, and Job will have his time to share. So we're coming toward the end of that second cycle. Then we have a third cycle. We're moving. Chapter a week. But you do know there's, what, 42 chapters. So hallelujah. Amen. At the end of the day, what is your proclamation? Well, that's one of them. Thank God I'm not Job. <laughs> or you go with more of the positive one that says, for I know <laughs> my Redeemer lives, even if you are Job. Amen. Let's stand before Jehovah. <laughs> Next time you start to go through something, say, oh, look, don't let it be Job. Don't let it be Job. Stop it right now. <clears throat> Jehovah, you are the most high. You are the most high, God. Jehovah, you're the most high, God. Jehovah, Jehovah.